Our next uh, lecturer is Dr. Luis Martinez. is a regenerative medicine anti-aging and longevity medicine specialist, clinical researcher, and biomedical consultant. He earned his medical degree at the Ponce School of Medicine and completed his residency training at the prestigious University of Pennsylvania. He also completed an advanced training course in stem cells in cancer at the Ponce Health Sciences University McGee Research Institute Consortium. He is board certified in clinical lipidology. Dr. Martinez holds a Master's of Public Health with a concentration in epidemiology and is fellowship trained in biosecurity. He is the president of Xanogene Clinic with specialized in regenerative and age management medicine. He also founded and presides over Regenera Global, a multinational corporation specializing in biotech, product development, research, and clinical consulting. Dr. Martinez is also co-founder of the Clinical Peptide Society, a United States-based organization aimed at educating physicians and advancing the use of peptide therapeutics. Alongside with the Age Management Medicine Group, he and his colleague have developed the world's first peptide certification program and have so far trained and educated hundreds of physicians. He is also the founder of the Senotherapeutic Network, which focuses on the clinical applications of senolytics and senotherapeutics in general. He additionally trains physicians in other aspects of re regenerative and age management medicine through his physician training portal, Elite Group MD. Dr. Martinez has been practicing bioidentical hormone replacement therapy for over 14 years. He was one of the first physicians to offer subcutaneous pelt therapy in Puerto Rico and is actively participating physician with most years offering this therapy. He was also the first Puerto Rican physician to offer a certified course in BHRT and subcutaneous pellet incision and has trained hundreds of physicians in this method. Please welcome Dr. Martinez. Thank you. Um, before we start with the plasmapheresis, plasma dilution therapy, uh, just a quick note. It's, uh, it's very interesting what Dr. Ruiz was talking about because in BHRT, you know, it, it, there's a lot of different ways or approaches that practitioners have. And usually in these events, and it happens a lot in the States, there's, you know, a bit of an exchange. Uh, different practitioners have different models of therapy. So it's very interesting. I think at some point, not today, but some other day, some other event, we can have like a, a mini symposium on BHRT and just have everyone present because it's a, it's a very wonderful field and it's full of different options. So having said that, I'm going to start today uh, talking about something relatively new uh, as it relates to aging. And it's something that really, you know, it, I'm very passionate about because what I was talking this morning when I gave the welcome the reception that there's so much to anti-aging and longevity medicine that goes just beyond you know, beyond the nutrition or the hormones, those are the fundamentals, but we're doing so many new things um, that I think are, uh, you, you guys should know about. So um, I'm going to be talking about plasma dilution therapy as a clinical treatment for age-related diseases. Um, so the objectives, uh, we want to discuss, first of all, the history of blood-based uh, therapies for rejuvenation purposes. Uh, we want to detail the effects of parabiosis, what is, what is that, um, describe uh, options, plasma-based options to the blood-based uh, treatments, identify what plasma dil dilution is um, and how it can impact aging and age-related diseases, and present a framework uh, for incorporating this into longevity medicine, anti-aging medicine, etc. So blood rejuvenation. Blood rejuvenation, it's not a new concept. We know that, you know, historically, mythologically, we have this concept of the, the vampires, uh, we have this concept of using blood to achieve youth. So it's, you know, it, it's something that some people might think, oh, this is crazy, you know, right? But it's not crazy. There's actually science behind that. So, um, and we have a, a long tradition with blood as that possibility. 
in, in the ancient times, um, historians in, in ancient Rome said that uh, spectators would rush to drink the blood of fallen gladiators. To receive that virility, to receive that energy, that youthfulness. And again, that might sound crazy for us drinking someone else's blood. But this has been happening throughout humanity, throughout uh, history. Um, in the Middle Ages, uh, there was a philosopher, Marsilio Ficino, 15th century. And he felt, he promoted back then, he said that drinking blood was a way for older people to regain their youthfulness. So this was, it was literally not that long ago, 15th century, a few hundred years ago. In, a, in Italy, you know, it was a civilized place. We're not talking about the jungles of, of Indonesia or whatever. So, and, and this man was talking about drinking blood for rejuvenation purposes. Um, again, we all know the history of the vampire mythology. Vampires, these immortal beings, they live, they need blood um, to, to continue living essentially forever, right? As long as they're feeding. So, and this has pervaded, you know, in our, in our culture, in our media, every, everywhere. So, again, we have this whole blood rejuvenation aspect. In ancient times, like religions, uh, Lilith in ancient Egypt, Hecate in, in Greece, they drank blood, they promoted blood drinking for their followers. So we see this in many different cultures, historically speaking, in, in, in ancient Aztecs, uh, sacrifice humans, and eat the heart or drink the blood. So this happens time and again, you know. So. There's actually, it's very interesting, I, there's actually a, a clinical, are there any psychiatrists here? No, okay. We need to invite some psychiatrists next time. Um, there's actually a, a clinical syndrome called Renfield syndrome. It's named after a character from Bram Stoker's Dracula. And it's uh, patients that feed on blood. Either they have this need, their perceived need of having to feed to receive energy, vigor, etc. And actually, when I, when I looked up the, the syndrome, actually, you go on internet, there's actually, nowadays, there's vampire clubs. There's communities are throughout the world of people that feel that they need to drink blood to become more youthful, their powers, etc. cetera. So, so this may not, it might seem, it, you know, it seems crazy, but it's out there. It's, it's happened historically, and, and it's happening, you know, nowadays, okay? So, Having said that, the question is, is this, do we have any evidence, you know, for blood to rejuvenate organisms? And the, and the answer is we do. Uh, there's a, a technique called parabiosis. I don't know if you've heard of it, but it's basically a surgical technique. You can join two organisms, you know, same, two animals, say, and you connect their circulation, okay? So usually what, what happens is, it's been studied for decades, Usually they can connect an old mouse, for example, with a young mouse, and they start receiving, circulation gets mixed. What happens is, with parabiosis, they, they can prolong the life of the older mice. They can extend life, it can rejuvenate, it has a rejuvenating effect because that mice is receiving the young, younger mice's blood, the growth factors, everything there. And, you know, interestingly, the older mouse, the, the younger mouse, becomes older faster. So the, older mouse, the younger mouse receives all the senescent cells, all the progeric factors, and these mice then change biologically just by having that exchange, that circulatory exchange. So it's been studied quite a bit, Stanford University. Um, they realized that there was definitely something in blood that was going on. So something in our blood, these growth factors, these youthful factors or whatnot, was having an effect and rejuvenating um, these animals. That's a, you can see there how parabiosis will look. So they're connected, and then it's just like one continuous circuit, okay? And, um, and you know, this was proof, you know, scientific proof that blood was having direct effects on aging. So this connection, it was, it was working, okay? Now, you can argue when you look at aging from that perspective, from the factors, and you can, you can look at what we call youth promoting factors, and you can look at progeric factors. So the, the youth promoting factors stimulate growth and repair, um, 
optimize autophagy, mitophagy, uh, control or decrease inflammation. And then the progeric factors do quite the contrary. So the progeric factors will prolong inflammation, progeric factors will cause senescence, will stimulate cat catabolism, and will incre increase insulin resistance and ROS production. So again, this can be controlled and looked at from a f growth factor perspective. Um, there's studies on plasma proteins and longevity. There's quite a bit of studies on this. And a lot of these studies have identified different plasma proteins that when they are mod modulated, overexpressed, underexpressed, et cetera, they can specifically alter the aging process in these organisms. So, and, and there's many of these proteins, so it's not just one. So we're seeing how the whole concept of what we have in our bloodstream is starting to affect and control how we age. Obviously, if we were to talk about, hey, you know, what can we do? I mean, so we know parabiosis works. It can, it can make people young. It can make animals younger. Obviously, we can't do this clinically. We can't connect to people and, and, and have one of them receive youthful factors that way, but, but there are options that we've been looking at. And this is where it gets really interesting. So we can't do that, we can't connect people, we can't do the Frankenstein-based approaches. But um, now we start looking at plasma-based therapies. So, you know, if the growth factors, if the proteins are in our plasma, what can we do to really start changing the clock, the aging clock, um, with these therapies? Now, Plasma-based therapies have shown equal in, 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 you know, in basic science studies, animal studies, lab studies, plasma-based therapies have shown equal or better effects than the actual blood-based therapies. So you had the parabiosis model, but when we were just doing plasma-based therapies, that was working quite well. Um, and then from there, we're gonna go from plasma-based into what, I'll take you into plasma dilution, but there's different types of concepts in plasma-based therapies. Um, so we have therapeutic plasma exchange, TPE, that's the main, main point of this talk. Uh, neutral plasma exchange, where it's a type of TPE, but you replace patients' uh, plasma with saline albumin. You have the possibility of plasma fraction infusions. These are particular subsets of plasma proteins that could be infused back to achieve a therapeutic benefit. And then you have, and this is just, this last one is quite a bit still experimental, but you have chronokine mimetics antagonists. So these are specific growth factors or modulators that could be infused into an organism to modulate aging, okay? We're gonna be focusing on, on therapeutic plasma exchange or also neutral plasma exchange in this, in this manner. Um, so when you look at you know, therapeutic plasma exchange, you can look at different aspects, either infusion treatments, if we were to actually replace with uh, donor plasma, fresh frozen plasma, or you can look at dilution treatments. So dilution treatments, we're just taking away, we're not adding anything else, we're just using, removing waste products, dysfunctional proteins, and allowing the body to sort of use that to repair, regenerate. Um, these strategies are gonna differentiate the clinical approach that we're, that we're doing. Um, either we reduce with some of these modalities or we add. Um, and it's, it's, you know, it's interesting because we can probably do both and we are doing both to a point. But, um, but what's, what's really interesting is that with the plasma dilution therapy, studies have also shown that it, it is at least as effective, maybe even more, than the infusion treatments. Because when, you know, when this whole thing with uh, blood and rejuvenation, growth factors, plasma, et cetera, started, some companies, biotech companies, some, some labs, et cetera, have been looking at uh, young donor plasma infusions. Um, some of you may have heard of it. There was actually a few companies out there that are researching that. There was a company a few years ago, biotech, called Ambrosia. Ambrosia Therapeutics, I, I spoke with the, uh, with the president a few times, and Ambrosia was doing patient-funded studies using young donor plasma uh, to treat older patients, especially older patients with Alzheimer's. 
So that was an additive treatment, but you know, there's some issues there with the fresh frozen food, the plasma, and uh, there were some issues with FDA in terms of addressing this as an aging strategy. So, uh, but it's, it's still an option. It's still, still some, you know, uh, universities and uh, companies are researching it, but we've, well, we're shifting into, towards this therapeutic plasma exchange as a neutral dilution where we're just taking away from uh, the organism to allow repair rejuvenation. And again, there's, there's you know, quite a few studies. I can send them to you. Um, this was a study using uh, just saline albumin exchange, and they saw rejuvenation equal or better in, in animals. Um, some of the things in the animal studies that have been seen with these, this exchange, for example, enhanced muscle repair, enhanced increase in orogenesis, improvements in fatty liver fibrosis. There's actually many studies on on therapeutic plasma exchange. It's, you know, it's, it's an approved therapy for autoimmune diseases, certain cancers, but there's also a lot of studies on different uh, conditions. And now, obviously, we're getting into the whole, let's use it for aging purposes. Um, so some of the proteins that have been shown to be modulated by therapeutic plasma exchange or plasma dilution, uh, some of them are EPO, platelet factor four, fractal kind, GDF, growth factors, IGF, um, and all of these uh, different proteins are involved in different aspects, neurogenesis, neuroprotection, uh, homeostasis, etc. So again, we know that doing these treatments, we're modulating a lot of these proteins. Um, also, uh, there's studies on how the plasma dilution affects senescent cells. I'm going to have a, another talk. Uh, my, the last talk of the day is I'm going to talk about senile therapeutics, if you guys are still awake. And, uh, and we're gonna be talking about that, but there's studies on plasma dilution and SB gal staining, so there's decreases in senescent cells with uh, patients that undergo plasma uh, dilution therapy. Now let's look at clinical studies, okay? So like I said, this therapy has decades of use, FDA approval for many conditions, autoimmune mostly, um, but again, the studies have been shifting towards the use of plasma dilution for actual aging purposes. And one of the big studies that we have on that end is the Alzheimer studies. So um, uh, some big companies in the field have gone into using uh, therapeutic plasma exchange for uh, Alzheimer's with positive results published. Now these are, these are just like I said, historically the different uh, conditions that have official recognition where ther therapeutic plasmapheresis can be used. So you have multiple autoimmune diseases, GVS, myasthenia, you have uh, MS, you have some different renal uh, complications, hematological. So there's many, many diseases that currently have an indication where plasmapheresis can be used. Um, and again, what, what's, been, what's good about this is that it gives us at least uh, a significant reassurance about the safety uh, of these therapies and the use. So I mean, obviously, you know, historically, thousands and thousands of patients have been treated with a therapeutic plasma exchange. Now, um, let's go into the actual Alzheimer's studies. One of the studies called the AMBAR uh, study, it's Alzheimer's management by replacement, by albumin replacement, AMBAR. So that was a study, 347 participants randomized to receive either, either the plasma exchange or, or sham. They did cognitive testing, baseline, uh, two, six, nine, 12 months. And they looked at different parameters, language fluency, processing speeds, short-term memory, et cetera. So that, those were the treatment arms, and you had in the treatment arms, you have the, the plasma exchange treatments, you had moderate and mild Alzheimer's, and you had low albumin, low albumin plus immunoglobulin, high albumin and immunoglobulin. Um, so they looked at different combinations of the uh, plasma and the albumin infusions. Um, basically, the studies showed significant, statistically significant improvements across different parameters, uh, processing speed, language fluency, quality of life. All of this in these patients uh, improved, uh, especially with the higher uh, albumin I immunoglobulin doses, okay? And again, this achieved uh, statistical significance. Verbal fluency was improved, quality of life changes. Uh, these, these patients, um, the results of these patients, the treatment with plasmapheresis, plasma exchange, 
the albumin treatments slowed the cognitive decline, functional and uh, global assessments were improved also. Um, Short-term me variable memory improved and like I said, the, the maximal results were noted with the albumin immunoglobulin uh, group. But even with the albumin group only, there were improvements. Treatment was very safe, well tolerated. For the Alzheimer's patients, and in this case, the challenge would be the frequency of administration. So initially it was uh, every few weeks, then they did monthly infusions. So I mean, it is a process, definitely. Um, although we're not, we're not looking at this same process for aging in terms of frequency of what we're gonna do. These are specific disease states that have been treated with this. So if, you know, incorporating plasma dilution therapy, clinically speaking, this is something that I, I'm, I'm currently doing. So, you know, we do here in, in Puerto Rico, also in Florida. So we have the device we're, we're receiving patients for the plasma exchange. For pros, uh, the, the good thing is relatively, it's, it's a safe procedure. It's a very safe procedure and we have a lot of data. There's no regulatory issues because these are FDA approved devices. Uh, we're, we are doing, you can call it off-label indications, but that's perfectly fine. We do off-label in, in the practice of medicine all the time. Um, the available clinical data uh, shows or favors, uh, it can benefit certain populations. And, and the in vitro and the animal studies have shown a lot, even a lot more improvements aging-wise. So we're looking at, you know, when we're doing these treatments, we're assessing epigenetic aging, biological parameters, and uh, we should be able to, within the next year, publish data on what we've seen with our patients, okay? And this addresses, you know, again, multiple aspects of the concept of the process of aging. here. Now, the cons of having this or offering this in an office. One, it obviously requires special equipment, special training. It's an expensive piece of equipment, so it adds investment. Um, we still don't have optimal, so this is part of it, and it's something we tell patients. We don't have optimal protocols. We don't know exactly which would be the best protocol specifically for aging. Do we need to do this quarterly, twice a year, or yearly? I mean, we have an idea, and that's what we discuss with patients, and we, that's why we measure pre and post lab work to decide on, you know, best targets there, but it's still not completely defined. And I know that, you know, as with a lot of things for us as physicians, we are uncomfortable with uncertainty. We want everything to be textbook explained and just digested, so that can be a challenge. Um, the other thing is that the benefits may not necessarily be, not necessarily be felt in immediately, this is a process. You know, you're taking away, you, you are uh, allowing the body to start repairing, producing. One thing that is interesting though, it does have um, uh, quite an anti-inflammatory effect. So when you have patients, you know, with high levels of inflammation, set rate CRP and all that, and, and they're symptomatic, they do usually feel better because I mean, you're taking away those inflammatory proteins. So uh, that definitely helps and that's uh, subjective immediate result if you want to call it that. Now, the other thing is that plasma dilution, you know, it can target multiple of the hallmarks of aging. This is something very important at, as, it, as it is. I mean, I think, you know, all of you that are really interested in, again, longevity and anti-aging medicine as a specialty, as a discipline, should know uh, the hallmarks of aging. These are certain parameters that are specifically affecting and causing and altering the aging process. And when we talk about the hallmarks of aging, we're looking at stem cell exhaustion, genomic instability, cellular senescence, altered cellular communication, mitochondrial dysfunction, loss of proteostasis, epigenetic alterations, telomere attrition, and deregulated nutrient sensing. Because all of these parameters are things that we need to look at when we're evaluating patients for longevity purposes. You know, and some of the things some of you might already be doing, maybe, I don't know, maybe some of you are already measuring telomere length. We have a lab here that offers telomere testing. Some of you may be ordering telomere length for your patients. That's definitely looking at one of the hallmarks, telomere attrition. And if, you know, if length is affected and there's certain, certain things we can do to address that, um, some of you may be doing some cellular senescence testing and so on and so forth. So we have different points here 
that can serve as a guide when we're looking at addressing patient-specific treatments. Um, like I said, additional benefits from, from this uh, plasma dilution are impacting directly cellular senescence. So we're eliminating a lot of these old cells and we're allowing the body to repair recover. So that's definitely something that uh, is a benefit. Uh, some of the observations we have seen, and it's also published, you know, normalization of CD4, CD8 ratios. And we look at that CD4, CD8 ratio as a marker of uh, senescence, immunosenescence. So we see normalizations there. Uh, modulation of Th1, Th2, that also needs to be balanced. Uh, I was talking here about the inflammation. Some studies have shown even one treatment, even one plasma dilution treatment can reduce inflammatory markers for many months. So that's why, you know, again, what we're looking at incorporating this as an aging strategy or anti-aging strategy, you know, this, this has shown with one treatment sustained benefits. Um, technical aspects, as I mentioned, it's very important that, you know, if you're going to do this, you get trained, equipment selection protocols, patient follow-up, it's all, it's all very, you know, it's a bit complex, you know, but it's not, but it is. Um, this is a basic, you know, diagram, therapeutic plasma exchange. Patient gets connected, one, one venous access to remove the blood, the other venous access to return the erythrocytes with the albumin saline, and the machine gets, traps the plasma component that we're going to remove. That's basically it. The good thing is that, first of all, for aging purposes, we're doing low volume uh, treatments, so it's really not much. I mean, we're doing maybe one, 1 1.5 liters total uh, replacement, plasma infusion replacement. So it's not, it's not, it's pretty tolerable, and, um, and in terms of a short term, less than, usually less than two hours, hour and a half. It's gonna depend a bit on patient parameters, hematocrit, platelets, et cetera. But it's very, very well uh, tolerated. Um, the adverse effects, adverse effects seen with TPE are quite low. Usually, you know, you might get patients a little lightheaded, a little hypotension. Um, you want to make sure, like, because you, we're using anticoagulant citrate, you want to give them a little calcium, some Tom's, you know, citrate can sequester calcium uh, and, and decrease it lightly, some paresthesia there, whatnot. But again, the levels that we use are, are very well within a safe margin there. So um, very well tolerated. And the other thing is that when we were, I was talking before about the differences between an infusion strategy, like for example, infusing young plasma versus uh, elimination therapy like plasma exchange or uh, plasma dilution. So with infusion therapies, you always get a much higher possibility of adverse events. Um, some studies looked at if you administer fresh frozen plasma, up to 27% of the patients will have side effects. With the, with the plasma dilution, it's 5% or less. And you know, we've done quite a bit, quite a few patients and uh, it's been very safe. So the other thing is with plasma dilution, you know, where do we go from here? So that's what I was talking about, frequency, combination strategies. Uh, infusion approaches, endpoints, um, that's all being, you know, defined. Um, one of the things that makes sense and we've been looking at and, and have done some patients, when you do a plasma dilution, then just infuse like the subfractions, like for example, the exosomes, the MSC nanoparticles. So you took away the, all the dysfunctional stuff and then you have a patient there and you just infuse exosome, exosomes there. Um, exosomes are quite popular right now in regenerative medicine, and it's a different sub, uh, subject, but um, so we have that option there. Uh, so yeah, we're looking at the different combination treatments that could be even more beneficial, because again, if, you know, the, the, the point here is, if we have these youthful factors circulating in our body, that will help preserve a more youthful phenotype. So we part of the pro, part of the reason why we age is because all these youthful proteins are decreasing and all these bad proteins or progeric factors are increasing so if we can modulate that approach we can do like these the connected mice and just rejuvenate um, so basically you know tpe it's a well-known safe 
FDA approved uh, therapy. And we know from the studies uh, that it can impact directly the aging process. And we're gonna continue to see, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm doing this here in Florida. I have some other colleagues that are starting to do this in other parts of the, the nation. Everyone's getting into it, publishing. There's some, Stanford is doing some clinical trials with it for aging uh, and some other universities. So we're gonna see a lot more about this. And, you know, I think probably uh, it will eventually become one of the gold standard in terms of therapeutic interventions to address aging. And, and by the way, just as a quick side note, I think I have time, I spoke pretty fast. Um, a quick side note, we are, we're not that far from, you know, officially, and I say officially because I think anyone that's in anti-aging medicine recognizes that aging is a disease, but we're not that far from officially, from a regulatory perspective, actually recognizing aging as a disease. You know, there's a, and there's a, t a trial, I think I, I talk about it in the other, in the other talk, TAME trial, which is starting to look at metformin for aging purposes and whatnot, so maybe some of you have heard of it. So, you know, that trial, when that trial ends, if the results are in favor, are, are, are good, uh, we might eventually see a regulatory indication for using something like metformin, something so that we, we know and we use to address age-related complications. So we're, we're pretty close from a regulatory perspective. We know from a scientific perspective that it is a disease and that we can affect it and that we can you know, revert it. So uh, the good news is that we have new strategies now that we can employ and we don't have to become vampires or drink blood from gladiators, okay? So I'll leave you with that and um, if you have any questions, I'm happy to address them.